So this is uh, Algorithms to Live By, and I'm speaking here with uh, Brian Christian. He's the co-writer of uh, Algorithms to Live By with uh, Tom Griffiths. And I wanted to start with this question. We, we just chatted a little bit about it, mm -hmm. that I, I, I think of uh, this book as uh, connected with uh, Malcolm Gladwell in a way, the tipping point where it offers people these eureka, opportunities to have eureka moments. And I, I think of the, the constraint relaxation algorithm, yeah. which Great. I think is really something that that'll take, people will take to heart. Maybe you could chat a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, we've all seen the, uh, the poster in the high school guidance counselor's office that says, you know, what would you do if you were not afraid, yeah. right? These things like this, or, um, you know, uh, career advice is what would you do if you didn't have to make money, you know, or what would you do if all jobs paid the same? And um, these forms of kind of uh, wishful thinking are, in fact, examples of what a computer scientist would call constraint relaxation. Um, and there's this long history within computer science of when faced with some of the hardest, most intractable, or NP-hard, as they're called, problems, computer scientists will often relax the constraints of the problem in order to make progress on an easier form of the problem, and only then try and work backwards to a solution to the, the actual harder version of the problem. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as we say in the book, this is more than wishful thinking. This is more than sort of idle fantasy or daydreaming. This is, in fact, one of the tactics, uh, one of the best tactics for making progress when you're up against a hard enough problem. And now I uh, will ask you another interesting question, interesting to me, I'm sure to everyone. Would you uh, share with us uh, how you came about this book, con considering that it, it dovetails with the, your, your last book? Yes, yeah, they are almost um, in a kind of dialectic in a way, because the most human human asks this question of what have we learned about what it means to be human uh, through the process of building machines in our Im own image for the last 50, 60 years. And in particular, what have we learned about human intelligence through the failures of artificial intelligence to capture the things that we think of as uniquely uh, and distinctly human? Um, Algorithms to Live By takes the question from a, from a different angle entirely, which is uh, there are a number of problems that all of us face in our everyday life whether it's you know finding an apartment or dealing with our overflowing closet or deciding between our favorite restaurant and a new restaurant. We think of these as uniquely human problems, but in fact they're not. They correspond to this fundamental set of problems uh, that computer scientists have been wrestling with for uh, you know the better part of a century. And so there's a huge opportunity for us to learn something about how to make better decisions in our own lives by exploring what we've learned about these problems over the years. And there's a, a number of things I, I could throw at you. This one I really am interested in, uh, to, in the t brief time we have. To estimate how long something will last, the best rule of uh, thumb is uh, to go by how long it's lasted. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. So like the United is... States, yeah, or you can determine more or less. Yeah, we give some uh, kind of comically precise predictions about, <laughs> you know, the United States is, you know, has been around since the 1770s. Okay, it's the 2010s now. We can then extrapolate that the U.S. will probably be a nation until the 2300s or something <laughs> like this. Um, and at a more practical level, you know, if you've been dating someone for three months and it's going pretty well, but you're trying to decide if it's worth booking those getaway tickets or if it's premature, uh, well, if the getaway is uh, less than three months from now, go for it. If not, you might want to just wait. Right? So. <laughs> Um, this type of thinking, it seems like one of these rules of thumb that is almost so simple that it can't be correct. You know, just double the amount of time that's, mm -hmm. that's been happening so far. Um, but in fact, uh, this is known as the Copernican Principle. Um, but it's really an, in, an instance of Bayesian reasoning, of Bayesian induction. So if you do not have any preconceptions of how long this phenomenon is going to last, and you kind of stumble onto it at some point in time, then the correct answer of the best, most rational prediction for how long it will last is indeed exactly as long as it's lasted so far. You just assume that you've arrived exactly at the midpoint in this phenomenon. Um, and we, you can derive this in two different ways. It's, it also results from um, what's known in, in Bayesian inference as an uninformative prior or a scale-free prior. Um, 
So there really is a rigorous math behind what seems like this super simple everyday rule of thumb. Um, and it can be applied in other domains as well. Uh, and the more you know about a domain, uh, the more accurate of a prediction you can make. So it turns out, for example, if you're predicting the gross of a movie, the best guess is that it will make 1.6 times the amount of money that it's made so far. So every domain has a little bit of a different coefficient. Um, but we, we just give the reader the, these kinds of uh, straightforward and readily applicable heuristics that are, in fact, grounded in, in what are the, considered to be the optimal solutions. Well, I wanted to point out that your book is, is very accessible. I find it has a, a wry humor running throughout Thanks. it. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That is there. And uh, just one of so many examples, like when you talk about the circuit uh, switching and packet switching. Yeah. And then you, uh, at, towards the end, in the, in the narrative, you say, well, in real life, if you're at a party, you're pregnant, you may be going to pick up 5% of a conversation. Yeah. So in real life, packet switching goes out the door. Right. Yeah, we, we use this example um, of uh, packet drops, which is a critical part of how TCP IP functions on the internet. Uh, the best way of thinking about it is uh, the post office in your neighborhood has all these packages. They're filling up the mail truck and sending it out on its route. And uh, the mail truck gets full, and so they just start incinerating all of the remaining packages <laughs> um, with the understanding that the sender will realize that you haven't gotten their thing and will just send it again. Um, and in a postal context, that sounds insane. Uh, but in fact, this is how the internet works and it's how it's designed to work, uh, which gives us, I think, a different way of thinking about uh, what to do when we're under pressure and overwhelmed, that there, there are times to just let things totally slide. I have a number of notes. I'm going to save some of this for my review, uh, which I'm going to get on uh, this weekend. But, uh, you know, your, your book, The Most Human Human, for some reason it makes me think of More Than Human, Theodore Sturgeon's yeah. book. And uh, this is kind of off the wall, but uh, what do you think of the, the hive mind? Are, are we ever going to reach that, or is that kind of science fiction-y? We, do, we, don't, we don't really want to reach that, do we? Or? Well, I mean, yeah, these are two, two very good and distinct questions. One is, will we? And the other is, <laughs> do, is that good or bad, right? Do we want that? Um, I mean, very much I think the most human human comes down on the side of the individual and says, um, you know, when we, when we walk out of a movie that we've seen, uh, with a close friend, we ask the friend, what did you think? And this is in a world where it would be painless to you know, just pull out our smartphone and read this very eloquent review by a learned theater critic who has all these you know, uh, eloquent things to say and can kind of put it into perspective of filmic history. But, but that's not what we really want. We want to ask our friend, uh, not because we want information about the movie, like we've just seen the movie, uh, but rather because we want information about the friend. And we want to learn something about them through their experience of this thing that we've shared. Um, and so, you know, this, this could just be my sort of innate species chauvinism kicking in, but I want to live in a world <clears throat> in which there's still value to doing that. And there still is, um, you know, tangible individual differences between us as a result of having these divergent uh, life histories. And, and that's part of what makes it interesting to meet one another. Otherwise, you know, we we would all be tapping into the same pool of knowledge anyway, so it would kind of obviate conversation, which I think would be very tragic. Yeah, I, I think we we seem to be losing some distinctions, but uh, I think the individual is going to always win out in the end. Um, and the algorithm, you uh, let's say. Uh, one last thought here. Sure. Chaos, uh, you, you can quickly devolve into chaos, you, and then you can quickly reach, grasp, or some sort of quick fix. But in the case of an algorithm, that's, that's not a quick fix. That's, that's, that's something tangible, something, a, security, a level of security you get from that, don't you? Thank yeah. You. Yeah, I mean, one of the points that Tom and I make in, in the book is that, you know, in many domains, the sobering news is that even following the optimal algorithm does not guarantee you that you will succeed. In fact, in some domains, it doesn't even guarantee you'll succeed more often than not. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talk about the field of optimal stopping, in which case, in which uh, there's this celebrated result, the 37% rule, which is, is this uh, optimal result for a famous problem called the secretary problem. But it only works 37% of the time. It just happens that you can't do any better than that. And so I think, if nothing else, 
Um, knowing that one is following the optimal algorithm, knowing that one is approaching the problem in the correct way, offers us, I think, a considerable consolation. Uh, especially if we know going in that, you know, that the odds are stacked against us. Even if things don't go our way, we don't necessarily have to stew over these counterfactuals. We can just say, well, I, I did my part and I just didn't get the break. Okay, well, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Brian. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thanks.